It's the first time we've ever done Job here, uh, so I'm excited about that. How many of you have, uh, have never been in the book of Job before? Raise your hands. Okay, then the rest of you can teach it. That's great. Um, if you're interested in books, uh, some people are, you know, if you're interested in, in uh, commentaries and things like that, I could give you a list. But the one that I really want to recommend, uh, someone introduced me to this book uh, probably, I don't know, over 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> the Gospel According to Job. This is not a commentary, this is a devotional. The Gospel According to Job by Mike Mason. Uh, this brother's gone through some deep water. And you can tell just by the, the things that he writes in it. So I highly recommend it. I've got it if you want to take a look at it later on. But um, I've recommended it to a few friends who've gone through some difficult times. And uh, one in particular, I think he's on his fifth reading of it right now. So, uh, you, it, it, I mean, it's not the Bible, right? The, the Bible is, you know, it's God's word. And so the more you read it, the more you, you just discover new things all the time. But there's something like that going on with this devotional. I don't want to, I want to be careful that I don't misappropriate, but uh, I, I highly recommend it. I'll just leave it there. So, uh, all right, the book of Job. We don't know its author. We don't know when it was written. And most people make a mistake on its theme. Well, we know a lot more than that, but uh, there's a lot of speculation about things, but some of the things that we assume about Job are usually wrong. Uh, most notably, the theme of the book of Job. Most people would say that the theme of the book of Job is why the righteous suffer. And if that's the theme of Job, you're welcome to try and show me later on where it tells us the answer to that question, because it doesn't. That's not what it's about. Uh, it definitely brings up questions like that, and that's why I've titled this Job Asking Hard Questions. I think it's important for us and a lot of times, you know, Christians are afraid of asking the hard questions. We're afraid sometimes, well, uh, somehow the, the Bible's going to disappoint us or, you know, God's not going to come through. But uh, this is a very deep book in many ways. Who wrote it? Don't know. There are different possibilities. Uh, some people, I guess you'd have like four or five different options. Uh, one, of course, would be that um, Job himself wrote it. Eh, maybe. I don't know about that. I think it's a little difficult to, to say that Job actually wrote it because he gives, us, he gives us information about the heavenly scene, which he really didn't have access to unless God revealed it to him later on. Uh, by the way, I, I, I want to be careful how much I get detoured on some of these things, but on the topic of inspiration, um, maybe that's a topic that you weren't ready for tonight, but when we talk about the inspiration of God's word, most of us nowadays on the, what I'll call the conservative side of the church, those of us who have a high view of scripture. We say the Bible is God's word, period. Written down by men, but authored by God, right? I think in this room, we'd all agree with that. Um, so when we say that the Bible is inspired of God, we have this assumption many times that just as we're told that, you know, holy, Peter tells us, holy men of old, you know, wrote down what God was showing them, true enough. But we, we make them, mis I think it's a mistake, it's only opinion, Good, good, good Christians can differ on these things, okay? But are we saying that the process is inspired or that the product is inspired? Well, the product obviously is inspired. It's all God's word. But when you start asking questions like, well, where did the information come from? Where did Moses get the information about creation? Where did Moses get the information uh, about the flood, about these types of things? Well, others must have written it down and then he had access to it later on and he and he assembled it. The product is what's inspired. And so when we talk about Job, we have a tendency to say, well, Job must have written it down. And, uh, and even though he, he didn't have immediate access to the heavenly scene that was going on when you know, God challenges Satan, you know, um, God must have told him that later on. <laughs> okay, you know, if you want to believe that, that's fine. I don't know that the... the, the the text actually supports that. There are other possibilities. Uh, one is that Elihu, uh, who's the fourth friend, so to speak, maybe not one his friend, but Elihu, who comes along around chapter 32, maybe he wrote it down. Uh, some people would say, since it seems to have occurred, the whole, this is probably the oldest book in the Bible, so it would seem that the, the whole scene was happening sometime around the time of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, somewhere around that timetable. 
Maybe Moses wrote it down. It could be. In which case, you know, Moses wrote the, the Torah, everything from Genesis to, to Deuteronomy, we'll call it nominally 1400 BC. So maybe it's about that old. Some people say Solomon wrote it, since it's part of the wisdom books or the poetry. We have, we have this section of our Bibles that we call wisdom or poetry, beginning with, you know, Job, Psalm, Job Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Uh, so it could have been Solomon. Uh, I don't know. You can have different opinions about that. I guess I have some of my own opinions, but it really doesn't matter. In any event, it's an old book, and it's an old story. It predates Israel from everything we can tell. Um, there's no evidence that, that there's anything Israeli about it, anything Israeli meaning Israelite nation speaking. So uh, basic summary, we could say that uh, we see the heavenly scene, and that's what I want to look at tonight, the drama behind the drama. Because there's a drama that we see, you know, the drama as far as Job's life, how he's being affected, what's going on in his life. But there's a drama behind the drama, which is very telling and very important for each one of us in terms of our own lives sometimes. And so, so we have the heavenly scene. And of course, you know, Job's afflictions, he loses basically everything except his own life and his wife. He loses his flocks, he loses his real estate, he loses his wealth, he loses his health, he loses his family. Uh, it's just left with him and his boils and his wife. And people have some snarky comments about her, but I'm not going to get into that stuff tonight. Um, I don't know that I would say all that. But anyhow, so you have the heavenly scene, you have um, Job's losses, and then Job's three friends. They're introduced at the end of chapter two, and uh, the three friends... Um, Eliphaz, the Temanite, um, Bildad, uh, the Shuhite, smallest man in the Bible, Zophar, well, some people thought it was Nehemiah, but it's really Bildad, the Shuhite, and then Zophar, uh, that's all we know, Zophar, but anyhow, Zophar is the Namathite. So you have these three friends and their opinions about what's going on, and basically what they're saying about Job is that there's some hidden sin. Job seems to be a good guy. Everybody sees him that way, but there's some hidden sin in Job's life. And then, I mean, that starts, they basically start talking around chapter 3. It's not until chapter 32 that another fellow shows up in the scene. People have their opinions. Maybe he's a little younger and he's just been waiting, you know, for his turn, but he speaks up, Elihu. And Elihu challenges them. He says they're all wrong, but still he's, he's got a problem with Job. And basically what he's saying to Job is that, Job, you need to humbly submit to what God has brought into your life so that you will understand the error that's in your life and that God will purify you through that. And then, of course, God speaks, chapter 42. That's the buckle-up cupcake Tighten your seatbelt, God basically says. I have some questions for you. In fact, he says, who is this who darkens my counsel? Uh, who's he speaking about? Well, he's certainly speaking about Eliphaz, because later on he'll, he'll say to Eliphaz, you know, you're a dead man unless you ask Job to pray for you. And if Job prays for you, then I'll listen to his prayers and you'll live. Like, <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, so then, then God challenges Job, and it just, it's boom. Boom, it's a Gatling gun. I mean, he just keeps bringing all these questions to him. And Job's saying, enough, I can't. No, no, I got a few more. It's okay, Job, I got a few more questions. Goes on through all of that until Job says, look, I, I just, I repent in dust and ashes. I was, I had no right even to speak. Think about that after all he's been through. And then God restores Job at the end, the last verses, basically, of chapter 2. Um, Usually what we do here is we go verse by verse through, you know, on a Wednesday night, we go verse by verse. Uh, I'm not going to go verse by verse through this, um, but we are, we'll go uh, clump by chunk through this. Uh, I'm not going to take 42 weeks or something like that to do this. We try to do it a whole lot less. So it's important that you read ahead, um, but we will take some time and, and look at and look at these verses here in the first couple of chapters. I wrote a note. Why did I write that down? You know, brilliant things come to my mind sometimes. 
And I can read Hebrew, but sometimes I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> but um, oh, maybe it'll, it'll make sense later. I'll leave it in the light. Okay. Uh, so let's start off. Oh, by the way, did you notice the song that we sang tonight? Uh, well, they were all great. Uh, that second song, how about that new song? Man, I love that song. We've got to do that more often. We also did one uh, that's been a, a favorite of Christians for, I don't know how many years it's been out, Blessed Be Your Name. It's the, uh, the song out of Job. And it's always fun to, to listen to a congregation sing that song, because we love the song. And part of the reason we love certain types of music, uh, like this one, is that it's just got, it's, 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 there's certain things about music that a lot of us don't even realize that moves us sometimes. The chord progression, the, the, the bass groove, things like that. We don't realize it, but you, know, you can kind of watch. If you con- watch a congregation sometimes, they're like, <laughs> Bless me. and I'm not mocking. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm doing. But it's just a funny thing to watch. It's a funny thing because what we're singing comes out of chapter one of Job. After all his kids are dead, after all of his wealth has been stripped away, after everything is gone, naked I came into this world, naked I'm going to leave it. The Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Like, I don't know that that would be most of our responses. But we love the song. So, and I, I think some of you know, we used to sing this, uh, there were years ago we used to, um, Boy, there's, there's, a, there's a thing about church life. There's pre-COVID and post-COVID, right? And um, we, we used to receive the offering during the, the fourth song or fifth song, whatever, the last song before the, the sermon. And um, for a long time, because, you know, we like to do things on the smile approach. You know, we start happy clappy. We kind of get people sitting down and, you know, more prayerful in our, as we sing to the Lord. Uh, and then we get people standing up again. It's good to get people standing up because it's going to be seated so long after that. And so we get another happy clappy at the end of that. And we often would do blessed be your name. And, uh, and then I, I finally said to the worship team, like, no, I love the song and I understand why we put it there. But it says there's pain in the offering. We're receiving the offering <laughs> during this song, you know. I, I don't know. If someone's going to catch on about that. I don't know that we should do that, you know. So... There were others like that that we had to edit out. Anyhow, all right, we're in the book of Job. (laughs) The drama behind the drama, and there is one. It's the oldest book in the Bible. It deals with a topic, aside from creation, that happened long before anything else that we read in the Bible. But what's going on here is very contemporary. It's happening in your life. You may not be covered with boils. You know, all your wealth may not have been stripped away. But we all have our issues. There are storms in our lives. There are storms, emotional storms, family storms, financial storms, health storms, all sorts of storms, all sorts of difficulties. And there's a drama behind that drama There was a man in the land of Uz. Uz seems to be a place, if you search it out, there are not many references to it in the Bible. Uh, You pick up a reference in Jeremiah 25, another reference in Lamentations 4. It's uh, east of Israel. It seems to be what most people would call southern Edom. We'd say, you know, the very far south of Jordan today. But southern Edom or northern Arabia, you may also call that Midian if you're interested in that. I'm in, interested, but um, so this seems to be taking place in that area. There's nothing, you know, we, we, we look at a man like Job, and so we just think everybody's Jewish in the Bible. He must be Jewish too. Well, he's, there's no reason to believe that. Just like Abraham wasn't, right? He came from Ur the Chaldees. So Job's a man. He's a righteous man. There was a man in the land of Uz, not Oz, Uz, whose name was Yov. And that man was blameless, and upright. He's not sinless. He's blameless. Tom. He's, um, it, it means he's, uh, your Bible may say perfect, but the idea is he's complete. He's, he's like he's got his walk with God. Doesn't mean he's not a sinner. We're all sinners, right? But he was, he was blameless and he was upright. Yashar is, a, is a, a word that God uses to describe someone who just walks according to what God has revealed to them. 
He was blameless. He was upright. He feared God. He shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him, also his possessions. Now, this man was loaded. I mean, you need to understand this. We don't think in terms of, of livestock. Most of us probably in this room never think of livestock. But when you look at how much he had, the dude was loaded. Okay? 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. In other words, tons of servants is the idea. Okay? So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons, you know, his sons seemed to be partiers. It doesn't mean they weren't decent guys, but there was a party going on all the time, it seems like, uh, with his kids. He's got seven sons and three daughters. They seem to be adult children, okay? Um, it's not like they're, they, they don't seem to be middle schoolers. It's not that kind of thing. They're adult, they're adult children. His sons would go and, uh, and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, uh, you can look at that as on his birthday. Some people see it that way. Or some just say, you know, they took turns. You know, rotating. Among all the kids, we'll have a feast at my house, and then we'll have a feast at my brother's house next month. You know, that sort of thing. So, um, Each on his appointed day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And so it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, you know, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And thus Job did regularly. Over the years, because I'm a pastor, I guess, um, people have asked many times, it happens a lot in the church, people ask about, how do you raise your kids? What's the secret? <laughs> What's the secret to raising kids? Buckle up, cupcake is probably the res right response. Um, you know, people have all kinds of, of good philosophies about raising children. There are a lot of right things to do. It's right to have a family altar. It's right to have quiet time in the home. It's right to teach our children their own walk with the Lord. It's right to expect our children to teach them how, but to expect them after we've taught them how to spend their own time with the Lord so that they're not just taking from mom and dad what we say the Bible says, right? But that they learn just as we had to learn what it means to walk with the Lord, what it means to open the Bible and to ask God for revelation from his word. But your kids are going to leave the home at some point. And they're going to fly. And even long before they do, even long before they get married or whatever the case may be, they're going to be making decisions that have nothing to do with what mom and dad might want them to do. Because they're independent, and just like mom and dad, they've been given an element of sovereignty. God created us in his image. And in that, in that, he, he's done that. He created us with sovereignty. We have, we have the, the right to make choices about our lives, and our children have that right as well. It cripples our children. It, it's a perverse thing if, if parents are making decisions for their children when they're 20, 21, 25. They have to, they have to learn to be adults. And certainly we've created uh, in, this, in the generation we're living in now we have, we have kids who are 25, 30, 35 years old who haven't learned to even think about being adults. I used to joke around that, you know, I want to, if, 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 if a guy's going to come and, and want to date one of my daughters, I want to know that he's not sitting in his mom's basement, you know, playing video games, and he's got carpal tunnel from playing video games. Like, and that's a problem. It used to be a joke, but that's a problem. It's a major problem in our society today. Well, how do you raise your kids? It's all sorts of things. But I learned early on in reading Job that what Job did here was important. I don't know what's going on in my kids' life. I think it's important to spend time and to, and to spend time with our kids and, 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 and you know, 
there's a tendency, moms have a tendency to, to know or at least think they know what's going on in uh, Jimmy and Sally's lives. But dad has a tendency to just leave it to mom and then go, go his own way and go to work. I think it's important, really important for men, dads, to spend time with our kids. Not just to go fishing with your son. Uh, it would be good to go um, clothing shopping with your daughter because that's an eye-opening experience. But um, <laughs> if nothing else, certainly, to just to have, whether it's a daddy-daughter date, a daddy-son date once, once a month, or so with them and learn what's going on in their lives. But what Job did is telling here. He doesn't know what's going on in their lives, but it may be, he said, that they've sinned in their hearts. He understands the root connection between what goes on in the heart and what plays out in the throne room of God. And so in his case, he, was, he, he would offer a burnt offering on behalf of his children. I think it's important for us. We, you know, we're not going to offer up burnt offerings unless it's the cat. You know, but... Um, <laughs> No, I, I'm joking. God would never accept that. God would never accept the cat. Why would you think that? But, um, but to offer our children up, to pray, to bring them up before the Lord on a regular basis, to really pray for our children and be active in our children's lives without them even knowing we're active in their lives. That's a very important aspect that we can ignore in what we consider to be such a busy society. Job understood that. He did this regularly. Now there was a day, I mean this, this almost begins with once upon a time there was a man named Job. And now we, we have now there was a day. And, and I, you know, not, I've, never, I've, I've never purported to, to, to ask anybody to think that I know a whole lot about the Bible, because I don't. And there's certain things about the Bible that I'm still scratching my bald spot about, saying, what is this? What, what really is going on here? And we have a lot of theories, all of us have our theories about what's going on here, and there's a lot we, we'd be better off in some ways admitting we just don't know. In fact, there's some things as we read them, we think, Lord, Why? Now there was a day when the sons of God, the B'nai Ha'elohim, you'll find it in Scripture, not very often. You find it in Genesis 6, two times. You find it in Job three times, I believe. Job 1, Job 2, and Job, uh, I want to say 38, could be 39, but anyhow. Um, and then you won't find it again until the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, it's speaking of angels. But also it says that you're the sons of God. And he came to his own, but his own received him not. But to, to, to all who received him, to all who believed on his name, he gave the right to be called sons of God, or children of God, depending upon your translation, but sons of God. We're sons of God, we read in Romans chapter 8, and a few other times in, in the New Testament. The bottom line is a direct creation of God. In the Old Testament, he's speaking of angels. And so the angels make report. That's what we learn here. The angels, there was a day when the angels, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. What's he doing there? What's he doing there? I mean, we just accept these things. It's good to ask questions. It doesn't mean you're going to walk away with an answer all the time. But it's interesting that, that he appears there. I mean, we... <laughs> We'll read in, uh, of course, in, in Revelation, I'll just read it to you. Revelation chapter 12 says there, uh, the, the great dragon was cast out, serpent of old, called the devil, and Satan, who receives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard the loud voice saying, In heaven now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our, uh, of our God, and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. He comes before the Lord. He's already been cast out. He doesn't dwell in heaven. He hates you. He hates humanity. All humanity. And he can't rob you of your salvation. That's a done deal. That was worked out at the cross, and when you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the deal was sealed. You're born again. You are now a direct creation, new creation, 
of God. But he's going to do everything he can to ruin you, mm -hmm. to ruin your life, and most importantly to him, your testimony about what good God is doing, has done in your life, okay? So, but yet nevertheless, he has to make report. He hates you. He hates humanity. He's out to destroy it, and he studies you. He's not omniscient. If he was omniscient, he would never have done to Job what he did because he would have read, he knows what the book says. So he doesn't know it all. But he knows a lot about you. A lot more than you probably know about yourself. So the angels came to make report, Satan among them. And by the way, and it says Satan. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, we'd say Satan. We think that's his name, okay? Uh, it's a title he's given, Satan. It's actually, uh, don't worry, I'll come out of this in a moment, okay? Um, but for those of you Bible students who really want to know what the Bible says, okay, no. Uh, but it's Ha-Satan, or the Satan. Satan, in Hebrew, means adversary, okay? Satan means adversary. Ha is a definite article, the. The adversary. That's what he's called here. The adversary was there with the rest of the sons of God. So we, we, we give him a name, and I know it may seem like a fine point to you, but I think it's, it's important to, to understand because that's exactly what is borne out in the rest of Scripture. He's the accuser of the brothers. He makes accusation against you. That's what he's doing against Job here. And it's important to look at what he has done and what God is actually asking him about. That's why I say it's the drama behind the drama. And sometimes it's not that comfortable. It's really not that comfortable. And so Satan is there among them. And the Lord said to the adversary, so where have you come from? And the adversary answered the Lord. And he said, well, from going to and fro throughout the earth and walking back and forth on it. Right? Remember, He's not in heaven. He just has to make report to God. And he's not in hell. He's not in the lake of fire. That comes later. He's walking to and fro throughout the earth. He's a finite being. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. If he's over here, he's not over there. You know, God's over here and over there and over there and over there all the time. That's different. This is, we're, and like, uh, this is not Star Wars where we have this, it's an interesting study, by the way, do the, do the study sometimes of the Star Wars motif, the idea of dueling forces. They're equal forces. Nah, that's not what's going on here, right? God's actually bringing a challenge against the adversary. It's important to see it that way. It seems like the adversary is bringing the challenge to God. God's actually bringing the, the challenge to him. Again, it's interesting. That, that's fine if you're sitting comfortably, you know, on the most comfortable seats in America, just listening to some guy prattle on for a while, and you say, okay, yeah, I, I guess I got that all figured out. Oh, no. Understand what's happening here, the dialogue that's going on between God and Satan. So then the Lord said to the adversary, have you considered my servant Job? Now, a lot of times we'll say God's bragging on Job. Well, okay, that's fine. It seems that way. But that word consider, it's actually a military term. The idea is, uh, you know, a, an officer will consider his adversary, will consider the enemy, will consider how high are those walls, how strong are his defenses, what do I need to do to penetrate and to, and to take it, right? That's to consider something. It's a military term that God has asked. Have you done this? Have you scrutinized? Have you analyzed? What's your conclusion about my servant Job? Ouch. Why are you doing that, God? Seriously, you can look at me like that and just say, okay. <laughs> no, put yourself in the situation. Have you considered my servant Phil? No, really. Put your name in there. Yeah, really. Have you considered my servant Dave? Have you considered my servant Steve? Have you considered my servant, you know, okay, put your name in there. Yeah. Have you scrutinized? Have you analyzed? Have you seen how strong and how weak he is? Mm -hmm. 
Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. And the adversary answered the Lord and he said, really? Does Job fear God for nothing? Like, yeah, I've been studying him. I've considered him. But he's a mercenary. He loves you because you bless him. You take care of him, of course he loves you. Anybody would do that. Have you not made a hedge around him? By the way, this is an interesting principle. It doesn't just exist in Job chapter 1. This idea of a hedge, I happen to be a big fan of the hedge. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? This is a very biblical term. Um, um, uh, here. Uh, don't know for sure, but very possible. This is written by Moses, Psalm 91. Uh, because you've made the Lord, who's my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he'll give us angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. That's the idea of a hedge. That's the idea of protection. It's okay to pray for the hedge. You want God's hedge. Because what's happening here to Job happens only because God lifts the hedge. He, he, he lifts the wall so that Satan can have access to him. You say, well, that's not right. Well, then get in line with the rest of the people in Job. And who are any of us to say what is and what's not right? Because God has created you, and God is sovereign, and God alone has the sole right to you, to, to you, to me, to any and all of us. He can do what he chooses to do with us. Have you not made a hedge around him and his household and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hand and his possessions have increased in the land, but now stretch out your hand and touch him, touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And I'd like to think that if the adversary was saying that to God about me, that he'd be wrong. But I'm old enough now to have seen enough people go through their issues and, and go through my own, which are nothing compared to Job's, and to know how quickly we can begin to fold and how, and how flimsy are what we consider to be our strengths sometimes because our strengths very often we think are biblical, but they're really not. They're really more cultural. They're where we live. It's the money, the culture that we live in, things like that. So many of the strengths that we have are, are based on our own, anyhow, on our possessions. I'll leave it there. You stretch out your hand against all he has, he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said to the adversary, wow, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So the adversary went out from the presence of the Lord. Gulp? Gulp? Really? The adversary went out. He had a philosophy. Job is a mercenary. Job loves you because of what he gets from you. But you take away what he has, and he's going to turn on you because that is man's character. He's not completely wrong, is he? Because that is the character of many people. So what is your foundation? That's what we each have to ask. What is your foundation? Is he really your rock? Or is he just the song we sing? You just have a good bass line, a good groove to the song we sing, and I can clap to it. And I feel good when I'm around him. There's a lot of gritty stuff here in this book. There's not a lot of happy, clappy stuff in this book. Stick around, though. I mean, it's worth it, I think. But there's not a lot of happy, clappy stuff going on here. Satan goes out from the presence of the Lord, and there was a day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came. There's four messengers here. Bam, 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 bam. I tell you what. A messenger came and said, the oxen were plowing, and the donkeys were feeding beside them, 
And the Sabians raided, the, they came from like Sheba, so in other words, southern Arabia, okay? Like the Queen of Sheba, 1 Kings 10, right? Queen of Sheba, that area. Um, southern Saudi Arabia. The Sabians came, they raided, they took them away. Indeed, they've killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was speaking, messenger two came along, and he said, the fire of God fell from heaven. Now, it wasn't God's fire, was it? Okay, this is, this is the devil... Did this. By the way, you notice the devil has control over a lot of things that we don't like to think of him having control over. Remember when Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves? He said, peace, be muzzled. It says, be still in your Bible, but really it said, be muzzled. He was speaking to an evil or a demonic force, right? So it was a, there was a wickedness about the storm. It wasn't one of God's storms that came along. The devil, however... Was, was given the ability to bring that storm. So the fire, it says, the fire of God, that's what the messenger saw, uh, the fire of God fell from heaven, burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, messenger three came along and said, the Chaldeans formed, they came from Iraq, the Chaldeans uh, uh, came and, and said, or he came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, they raided the camels, uh, they took them away, yes, they killed the servants at the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, messenger four came along and said, your sons and your daughters, now think about this, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's home. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they're dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Job arose. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell to the ground, and he worshipped. He didn't sing, blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't sing a cool song with a, with a good bass groove to it. He worshiped. In other words, the object of his attention was God alone. That's the idea of worship, right? The, the word here for worship, it means to put your nostrils in the dust. We think worship is, I, I sing, I clap after every song. We, all these things, that these are cultural things that are really not God. They're man's ideas. God's idea, worship, comes from the old English word, worth. Ship. He alone is worthy of our praise and, and, and glory, right? So the Hebrew word shacha means to put your nostrils in the dust and to recognize that he alone deserves the worship. Job, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell to the, down, the ground. He worshiped and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Oh, he didn't say, what have you done? God, why did you do this to me? He didn't do that. It was 20 years ago today. It was the first time I ever did a, a funeral. Um, I had, uh, most of you know, uh, I'd spent about 25 years in business. And uh, the church started up, and I never knew how any of that was going to work out. As you know, I never wanted to be a pastor in the first place. And so I, uh, I was, you know, Rich and I had a partnership, and we were doing our thing, and that supplied the income while the church was starting. And uh, uh, this time of year is often when Renee and I will go away for a couple days for our anniversary. And so we, uh, we'd gone away, and we were about an hour north of here, and... I remember one of the things that was stirring in me was, you know, what, what am I going to do? Am I going to go full-time? Can I, there's too much story. For, I'm just, so am I going to go full-time as a pastor and kind of give up that job? Um, can, I, can I do it? And, uh, and I remember praying and thinking, yeah, what would it be like, like to do the first funeral? I've never done a funeral before, you know? I, probably, I figured it would probably be, you know, a sweet, you know, lady who, you know, loved the Lord, you know? And um, anyhow, we... That evening, Renee and I, we had dinner, and we came back to our room. Got this phone call from one of the elders um, who said, uh, I think you need to come back. He said, um, he named this couple whose son 
looked like he was about to die. Um, Thirteen-month-old boy who uh, had severe head trauma, brain trauma. And um, it's like, what, like, what do you even do with that? I, I mean, I can't imagine being in their shoes, and here I am now as a pastor, their pastor, and what do you do? And it's like, okay, yeah, we, we left and driving back. Okay, what do you say? There's nothing to say to somebody in a situation like that. And, we, and the only thing that came to, to either of our minds was you weep with those who weep. That's, that's all you do in a situation like that, right? And um, Max was his name, Max Humphreys. And um, the hardships, the challenges of life are so much deeper than most of us ever even begin to think. You learn a little bit more about them sometimes when you're a pastor, not always, because uh, we've all had our deep waters we've been through, and some of you have been through deep waters with someone else. There's some really deep water out there, really deep water. And it's very easy, sadly, it's very easy to live in the realm of cliché. Say, well, it's because of this. Well, you do this when that happens. You know what it's like, you know. Uh, you're in the Lord for six months, you know everything about the Bible, you know. You're in the Lord for about five years, you don't know as much as you used to. You know, it's kind of like parenting. When you have no children, you know everything about how to raise children. You know, once you have children, you realize you don't really know as much as you thought you did. And by the time you've got teenagers and people are asking you, so what's the secret? You say, I, you know, I really don't know. <laughs> Just pray, man. <laughs> you really got to pray. Um, there's some really deep water. In all of that, with everything that happened, he didn't make any foolish charges. People have a way of bringing really foolish charges against God. God doesn't care about me. God does not love me. Look what happened. If he loved me, this would not have happened. You know, and we can, we can think sometimes, well, people shouldn't say stuff like that. When the reality is we may not say it, but very often that's exactly what goes through our minds. And all that still, Job didn't sin by bringing any charges against God, and yet he's wiped out. It just in a matter of minutes, bam, 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 bam. He's lost everything, or so he'd think. And then there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and the adversary came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, where, where do you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro throughout the earth and walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to the adversary, have you scrutinized, analyzed my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, blameless, upright, fears God, shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, even though you incited him, incited me against him to destroy him without cause. In other words, Satan's philosophy didn't work out, right? He had his philosophy, Job's a mercenary. Just proved that wrong. Now what are you going to do? Satan answered skin for skin, yet all that a man has, he'll give for his life. You stretch out your hand now, you touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to, his, to your face. Is he wrong? You see... Satan is a studier. He's a student of humanity. He's a finite being. It wasn't created all that long before the heavens and the earth and everything else were created. Well, let's call it nominally, unless you're an old earther. Nominally speaking, 6,000 years he's been around. How long is a man or a woman going to live on planet Earth? A little longer nowadays in America at least, but let's call it 75, 80 years on an average, maybe. Oh, he's been studying humanity for so long. He knows what typically is in a man or a woman's character. Skin for skin, you touch him, you rob him of his health, he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said, he's in your hand. Oh, This doesn't bother you, apparently, because it hasn't happened to you. This doesn't bother you, apparently, because, no offense, no offense, I mean no offense by this. Because even though 
in this room, I, th I think we'd all agree, this is the word of God. Nevertheless, it hasn't happened to you. So it's sort of like fiction, even though we know it's not. It happened to him, but it hasn't happened to me. Except it is very true. And the Lord said, he's in your hand. Just, don't, just spare his life. You see, there is a hedge. There's a hedge around each one of us. It's one thing to pray for a hedge. That's good. But there's only so many things that the enemy can do to you. Those things are based on what the Lord allows. And that's good to remember, but be careful what you presume about it because you're not God. Because you don't know what God's purposes are for you. See, the book of Job is not about why the righteous suffer, although that's a timeless question for all of us. Why do bad things happen to good people? And, and I won't bother pulling that question apart. But, you know, that's, that's the question we always ask, right? Why do the righteous suffer? Okay, we don't get the answer to that here. But what we do see in it is that God is using these things in Job's life. We don't get all the answers for why or how. But that is part of the explanation for some of this. And so we like to just hold on to the fact and we're, we're told, here it is, uh, 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. We usually stop there. That's terrible we stop there. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, He's got the way. You've got to take his way. We often take, it's the, the old, Wayne Mumble used to call it half of, the, half of the word heresy, right? We, we take half of it. We don't take the rest of it. You know, like, like Jeff was talking about on, on the retreat. We don't take the whole verse. God has made the way of escape. So we have to follow him. We have to follow him through it. God has a purpose. And there are going to be deep waters in your life. There are going to be deep waters in every single one of our lives. None of us want to go through what Job did. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Uh, I shouldn't ask. You don't have to tell me, but I mean, like, have you ever had boils? I mean, I, I, I uh, um, years ago, long gone far away in another galaxy, um, when, when Rich and I were in business, he used to take, he used to do the photography and I would write the copy. We were in advertising. And um, I remember we were, we were working for a company that made anesthesia equipment and I needed to understand better how it actually operated. They said, well, come on into the, uh, the operating room. I said, Rich, you want to go? He said, no, because he was afraid he'd fall over passed out in the sight of blood. And so I said, I, I don't care. I'd love to see that stuff. And so I uh, went into the OR, and I remember the first, uh, I, I saw a, a sequence of surgeries, but the first one was a guy with a boil on his butt, basically. Basically, you know, I hope not, none of you were him. But anyhow, I, I remember <laughs> watching this, and as they were administering the anesthetic, local anesthetic, and, uh, of course, they have to ask the guy, do you feel this? You know, they kind of poke the boil. and Oh, yeah. Okay, and they'd kind of like stand back and wait for the anesthetic. to go and poke him again. You feel that? No. I mean, it was like a hard-boiled egg sticking up on top of like his tailbone. And, um, and then, the, the, I'll never forget, the surgeon took these forceps. They looked like big, like, barbecue tongs. And he squeezed it, and he pulled it up. Do you feel that? No. Nope. Someone else said, brings tears to my eyes. Like, yeah, I mean, like, oh, oh, my word. He was covered, covered, I'm telling you, covered from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He was covered with boils. 
as you go through, you know, as you go into chapter three, chapter seven, some of these other places, he's going to describe how his, his, he's clothed. He's, here he is, he, we're going to see that he's, he's got potsherds and he's scraping the boils. You with me? Scraping them. Okay, yeah. Come on, you got to live this. You got, I'm not trying to gross you out. I want you to live it, to feel it, to, okay? It was putrefying, the smell. He was rotting, he was dying, Is really. He even says it. He had the breath of a dying person. Have you ever been near a person dying? You, anyhow. But, and he says, I, I'm, I'm clothed with worms. His, these boils were infested with worms. I'm not trying to gross you out. I'm telling you what the adversary did to him. Skin for skin, you touch his body, he'll curse you to your face, he said to God. But he didn't do that. He took himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of his ashes. And then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Thanks, hon. <laughs> now, some people say the devil knew what he was doing. I mean, he took all of his wealth, he took his children, he took everything that he had, he afflicted his body, he took everything, but he left his wife. <laughs> and, and it's like, not, but I think, no, I have to say that because there's another side to it. There is another side to it that you don't see in English. And the other side that you see in Hebrew is that, that it, it gets a little complex to explain it all, but that word curse is a softer idea. It's related to bless. I know it sounds strange, but it is. And it seems that what she's really doing is looking out, in a sense, looking out for him and saying, get it over with. Why, why extend this in your life? If this is what you're up to, she doesn't know the divine drama. She doesn't know anything about that. She just knows that all of this has happened. If you're going to die, go quickly. Because that's where he's at. And he said, he said, you're speaking as one of the foolish women. Shall we indeed accept good from God? There's a question that I'm not prepared to say it the way Job would say it. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. When Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. They, they, they traveled a long way. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite. And they made an appointment together to come and to mourn with him, to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar, they didn't recognize him. He, had just he didn't look like the man they knew. They lifted their voices, they wept. Each one tore his robe. They sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. People say a lot of things about Job's friends, and I understand, and they do deserve a lot of the criticisms. Because there is a tendency, you know, he'll say to them at some point, miserable counselors are you. you know, what kind of comfort am I getting from you? But first of all, they came from a long way to be with their friend. That's a big deal. A lot of us are happy to send a text. Hope you're doing better. <laughs> Let me know if I can do something for you. And I know what that means. We, we've all said it. Because we don't know how to deal with adversity in someone else's life. We don't know how to deal with painful situations in someone's life. It's almost, it's easier kind of to keep the distance. But they traveled a long way. That means they gave up a lot to be there. And they didn't just come to him, but they came to sit with him. And they didn't speak to him. They didn't say anything. They, we, we, you could say, if you read this with Jewish eyes, they sat Sheba with him. Seven days, seven nights, didn't say a word. They wept with him. And when they did speak, they didn't talk about him. 
They spoke to him. Eh, okay, you can make your comments about what they said. Look, there's a drama that's playing out here. There's a cosmic conflict that most of us would rather not know about, frankly. But it offers, it, it offers important, very critical insight to understand what's going on in the heavenly scene, and yet at the same time, there's only so many conclusions that you can really draw. Because God's doing this, and God has a purpose. It would be very wrong to draw this conclusion. It would be very wrong to conclude that God is having fun with, his, with the adversary. No, that's not true. He's not doing that. You and I were created in the image and likeness of God. And people, people argue, theologians love to argue about when Satan fell and all that. It would seem to me, based upon what we read in Isaiah 14, that Lucifer is the one, Satan, you know, who, who said, you know, I will sit on the heights, the, the heights of the assembly. I, uh, I will be, ultimately, five I wills, but the, the, the ultimate one was, I shall be like the Most High. And yet, who's creating the image and likeness of God? Adam. And so he had to do everything he could to destroy what God had created because of the pride and the envy that was in his own heart. And so he's constantly working there. And so, yes, there is this cosmic conflict. Yes, there is this divine drama that's going back and forth, this war in the heavenlies. God's the victor, and God is working something of immeasurable value in your life, in your life, based upon what's happening there. He's not doing this for no reason. He's doing this because of his love for you. And that's hard for us who live in the realm, we like to say grace, we live in the realm of karma more than we live in the realm of grace. We'll talk about that another time. But... But we really do. We live in the realm of karma as opposed to grace. But God's purposes in this life and what he's doing behind this veil that we live in, live behind right now, what he's doing is working out for you a much greater measure of his glory in your life. That's why I, I, I'm always astounded when I come to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, that his purpose in all of this that in the ages to come, he will be continually unveiling more and more of his grace toward us. We'll be understanding more and more throughout all of eternity ahead. Job will understand, of course, but so will you, so will I. Those things that happened in our lives and what the purposes were. God has a great purpose. Now look, when we get back next week, I'm going to do my best to, to move. We're not going to, I wanted to go verse by verse for these first two chapters, but we'll probably take on at least, at least three, hopefully four chapters, and we'll just kind of go clump by chunk through this, and we'll make progress, because it's all different, but a lot of it falls into the same categories along the way, so uh, or the same categories of, of uh, issues that are being raised by his friends. So.